All right, welcome back guys, Sam here with another short video just covering um, some key information about making your diet work for you in the long run. Um, so I suppose the title of this one, or what we're mainly gonna be covering is balancing diet flexibility and rigidity. Okay, so to start off with, long-term success is going to be determined by what you can sustain. If we're unreasonably strict in the short run, it's likely gonna come at a cost that we're not willing to pay down the track, right? Um, so bear with me and I'll get to the explanation shortly. If we're too flexible, it comes at a cost as well. You know, maybe we waste time, we don't get the progress and the results that we want. So we have to kind of find that balance between, you know, what sacrifices we wanna make, what sacrifices are necessary, and being a little bit intelligent and deliberate in the way that we make those decisions so that we can both have flexibility as well as our rigidity and constraint to actually allow us to see that progress. So the reason that I was initially doing this video was someone asked about cheat meals, right? Um, for the most part, I don't like that term. I don't think um, many coaches really do because um, often they get a bad rap. A cheat meal would, I suppose, be an instance where someone is not complying to their diet right? They've just gone off the plan completely and all hell's broken loose. And that's not necessarily ideal. What the context in which this topic was initially brought up was effectively just a planned cheat meal, um, which is not cheating because it's planned. So, you know, by definition, it can't be cheating. Um, so really we want to avoid cheat meals for the most part. And we want to plan flexibility into your diet to allow you to sustain it for long, longer durations and to allow you to actually get to where you want to be. And that is kind of the aim of the game, really. So again, the main focus is we want to be flexible in our structure and understanding when it is appropriate to say no. Again, balancing leniency with the strictness of dieting, right? They both have to be working together. Okay, so again, saying no sometimes is okay. It is necessary, right? If you want to lose five kilos, you can't go out and drink every weekend. You can't go and you know eat out every single night because chances are that's going to slow or actually you know prevent any progress from actually occurring. And that is not in line with what you're trying to achieve. So we need to work out what are the constraints in which we can work, right? That's why we you know track calories. That's why we control our intake. You know, we control our activity. We try and control variables so we have a good understanding about what is the wiggle room that we have. And then within that constraint, we have flexibility and freedom to move, okay, which is fantastic. So <clears throat> if you're planning to have a meal, you know, out, you're going to go and have a dinner with friends or, you know, you want to be a little bit more liberal, we prepare and we plan this into our program, into our plan to make sure that it actually works so that you can have that, you know, that short break, you get to have that meal out, you know, maybe you have a drink, you get that, you know, social, you know, satisfaction, you know, you got to eat out, but you also get the satisfaction of knowing that you're still working towards your plan. You are still on track, right? That's a win-win in my books. <clears throat> so we really want to avoid the mindset when we're in these situations of I'm off the plan. Right? We need to, again, be deliberate and you know, decisive in how we're approaching it. Okay, So just to give a couple of examples, right? I'll use myself. Um, so in the past, like when dieting, it's like Friday nights is typically burger, burger night. Okay, So if I'm going out with you know, my friends, my partner, and I'm having a burger and you know, chips and stuff, well, instead of saying, oh, well, I'm not going to go to burger night because I'm dieting for fat loss, well, maybe instead I look at the decision I'm making and say, how can I adjust this decision to be more in line with what I'm trying to achieve, right? So I still have the, fl the flexibility of going out to Burger Night, but we're just making a little bit more rigid because now the constraints are, you know, a little bit smaller or tighter, you know, from a caloric standpoint. So, you know, maybe you go out and instead of, you know, loading up with the biggest burger, a fries and shake, maybe you just get a standard regular burger, you know, not, not with all the fixings. And then maybe you get a small chips and no shake, right? Or a diet soft drink or something. 
there, you have still cut out calories from what you would normally do. We would still wanna track that and keep that as consistent and constant as possible in our diet. Um, again, so we can control variables, but you can kind of see how that can work in your favor. Now, obviously there'll be times when we need to make sacrifices. You can't just, you know, you can't always eat burgers through a diet. Um, it's probably sustainable to a point, but there may come a time where it's no longer sustainable. Okay, um, another example uh, that I can, I suppose, share is one of my good friends and clients, Timmy, uh, weighed 79 kilos and then six months later without tracking a single calorie or macro, got down to, I think, 70 or 69 kilos. So he lost nearly 10 kilos, right? When we were assessing his diet and making these changes, we were looking at, you know, balancing, again, his freedom and flexibility. He's one of the people who came with me nearly every night to go and get burgers. He still made that work in his diet by making smarter decisions during the day. So he was making sacrifices during the day. Maybe he was eating a little bit less. Maybe he was, you know, he was banking his calories or maybe he was shifting some calories from one day to another to allow for that you know, little bit of extra freedom and flexibility on the Friday for his burger without completely going off the plan, right? The reason this is beneficial is because it will allow us to hopefully adhere to our diet long-term. Again, too flexible, probably not good because you won't get the results you want too strict. You know, yeah, maybe you see some fantastic results, but it's not going to be not likely that it's going to be sustainable for a long duration. And, you know, dieting takes time. So we need to keep that in mind, right? If you want to be dieting for 10 plus weeks, well, maybe going completely cold Turkey on all of your, you know, the foods you normally eat and just completely overhauling your diet. Maybe that's not the best approach because it's going to be such a drastic change right? Yes, you might be able to um, adhere to it short term, but you know, long term, you know, if you're not having any enjoyment in your life, you know, you don't get to eat out, you don't get to see friends, you know, what are the chances are you, that you're going to sustain that? Or when you get to the end of the diet, you have built no, you know, new systems or structures or processes or guidelines, you know, for you and how you make decisions about food, to actually allow you to then, you know, return to the real world and make intelligent decisions that are in line with what you're trying to do. So then you, you diet and, you know, as we often hear, a lot of diets fail and people regain their weight and end up back where they started. Not ideal. That's why we want to kind of really focus on making good decisions and balancing our rigid and strict approaches to our diet. And we want to make them work for us. So in short, when you are making decisions for your diet, whatever those changes are that you are making, they must be sustainable. Otherwise you'll get to the end. And if you can't continue to keep them, even for the most part, right, you finish your diet and we just need to maintain 80% of the habits that you have to, you know, for, for an arbitrary number's sake to sustain where you are. If you can't sustain those habits and the things you've been doing, then, you know, you're going to be up shit Creek without a paddle. Unfortunately, so we want to walk that fine line of balancing, you know, the decisions we make and the sacrifices we make, right? A good rule of thumb and something that I like to get my clients to do is ask them or ask yourself at every opportunity while dieting, whether it's for fat loss, whether it's for maintenance, whether you're dieting to try and put size on, it doesn't matter. The first question is, does this align with my current nutrition goal, your objective? So it's not just, you know, a micro, um, you know, analysis of whether or not that aligns with what you're trying to do, but we're looking at on a large scale. Okay. So how does this individual meal or this individual food item fit in the bigger picture of your week, your month, your six month plan? And is this something that if you start to do it, you're going to be able to do it for the long term? So do, does going out and having a burger, fries, shakes with everything, you know, loaded up, align with the fat loss goal? Maybe it does. Maybe you can make that work, but you're not eating for the rest of the day. Um, can you do that long term? Well, I don't know. Once you start to get hungry down, you know, six, seven, eight, ten weeks in a diet, maybe that's not going to be the best idea. So again, that's why we need to look at, you know, not these, these decisions on a short term scale and a longer term scale, right? So success in the short term, in the short run, is only going to be beneficial if you can sustain it in the long run. 
So again, ask yourself if dieting for fat loss or if dieting for maintenance or a surplus, does it align with my goals? Can I sustain it long term? And if the answer is yes and yes, go for it. If the answer is no, maybe make a change. And again, when we're making changes, right, we kind of want to be, you know, self-correcting. We want to be asking ourselves, how is this in line with my goal? at every opportunity that is going to facilitate long-term success because you'll always be correcting where it is appropriate. Now we had a couple of questions as well submitted. Um, so I'll try and get through these in a somewhat concise manner. Um, so the first one was from Tanya who I'll paraphrase here said or asked, um, sometimes we hear if you're hungry, you need to eat. Um, you know, but obviously if you applied that in practice, you're probably not going to get very far if you're dieting for fat loss. And yes, Tanya, that is pretty much true. Um, if you are hungry, well, your body thinks you need to eat, but you know, again, we want to look at context. Maybe you don't actually need to eat. Um, if it's your goal is fat loss, hunger is going to be something that you should be experiencing at a point. Um, even at multiple points for multiple, like for you know, an extended duration. And that is okay. Understanding that is liberating um, when dieting for fat loss. So we must make changes in order, you know, to see that uh, fat loss happen. Um, so that means going hungry at a point in time. Um, however, we want to be intelligent and again, deliberate in our decision-making to minimize the, I suppose, abruptness or the, you know, the severity of the hunger that we experience early on in the diet, right? So, you know, after 10 weeks of dieting, yeah, you're probably going to be hungry, but you don't want to be starving after two weeks, right? That probably means you're making some poor decisions um, as far as like meal composition uh, goes. So again, we want to be a little bit more intelligent. We want to kind of build our meals in a way um, and you know, make decisions in a way that is going to allow us to sustain that diet long term, so that we can kind of ward off hunger as much as possible while still getting into a deficit, so we can achieve the fat loss that we want. <clears throat> okay, so it's like effectively, fat loss is just controlled starvation, right? That's you know, you're just not eating enough for a period of time. If you ate one less calorie than you needed every single day of your life, you would eventually die of starvation. Uh, it would be a slow burn. You'd probably look really lean for a little bit and really shredded and really jacked, maybe if you're preserving some muscle mass because it's such a small deficit. But if you continued it forever, you'd eventually run out of energy. I actually don't know how long that would take, um, but that just kind of gives you an idea. Again, like we, we talk about sustainability a lot here. Fat loss is not sustainable long, long, long term, right? You, again, you would die if you just ate at a deficit forever. So we can't do that. Um, a, a good little, I suppose, analogy is to think of dieting like decelerating a car, right? So we want to slow it down, right? We're going to reduce the number of calories we're eating so we can drop our weight down but then we're not going to just keep going until we stop, right? Because if we did that, you know, we're, we're dead. Um, but we're going to reduce our calories, get to where we want to be, and then we want to ideally hold that new, new speed, okay? Instead of just re-accelerating and ending up back where we started. That's not ideal. Um, so <clears throat> I suppose, in short, if you're hungry, um, yeah, maybe you need to eat. But if you're dieting for fat loss, then maybe you shouldn't be eating. Um, I suppose like the second part of this question, or, you know, sometimes if you, the, the inverse of it, if you get to the end of the day and you're not hungry and you have calories left and you are dieting for fat loss, do you need to eat those? Well, maybe not. Um, I typically, you know, at, depending on where the person is, and again, this is a very individual thing uh, in their diet. Um, sometimes if you get to the end of the day and you have 100, 200, 300 calories left and you're not hungry, you don't have to eat. Again, dieting, we need to accept that sometimes we're going to be hungry and sometimes you're not going to be hungry. Um, the body is a wondrous thing and will respond in a milieu of different ways in different scenarios. 
So if you're dieting for fat loss and you find yourself in that rare situation that, hey, I'm just not hungry today, I'm not going to eat, that's okay because, you know, chances are you might slip up somewhere else. You know, you're human, that's perfectly okay. And, you know, if you take that extra two or 300 calorie deficit one day, that's just going to help kind of speed things along a little bit. But again, we don't want to overdo this. Um, you don't want to just not eat every day because then you're just going to like really slam the brakes on on your car. Everything is going to like plummet really quickly. And again, that's not going to be sustainable. Um, we want to decelerate slowly. We want to be a little bit intelligent and uh, again, making decisions uh, that align with our long-term plan and long-term goals. Okay. <clears throat> So, and lastly, to address this question, if you find yourself hungry, assess what foods you're eating, right? If you're week five in your diet and you're going, oh my God, I'm really hungry, but you're still having, you know, a packet of chips and you're having a muffin, you know, from the local cake shop and, you know, you're having full cream milk, you know, three coffees a day. Well, maybe we need to take a good hard look at the decisions you're making. Um, again, sacrifices will be necessary and we can use them to our advantage when dieting um, to trade off from, you know, highly dense, highly caloric foods, things that are super tasty to things that maybe don't taste as good, but they're going to be more bang for your buck. They're going to have a higher nutrient, you know, um, nutrient composition or nutrient back. Uh, yeah, nutrient composition. Um, <clears throat> and they're going to help you keep you fuller for longer which is pretty much what you want in a diet. Okay. So, you know, for example, going cold Turkey early on in the diet, maybe not, but we slowly start to make sacrifices. We make substitutions. We go from full cream milk to, you know, skinny milk. And then maybe we go to, you know, just long blacks and we're not having milk in our coffee anymore. This is a way that we can kind of combat against hunger throughout a diet. Okay. So just making trade-offs and understanding that they are there um, to be made. Um, and they are necessary when dieting gets tough. Um, so, you know, if you're finding yourself hungry and you're going, oh, well, I need to eat because my body's telling me to eat. Well, you have to fight that to diet for fat loss. Okay. So again, like stack the odds in your favor, eat plenty of veg, high protein, you know, eat plenty of salads, try and avoid eating really highly palatable foods that are high in calories that aren't going to give you a lot of, um, you know, bang for your buck. Um, the next question <clears throat> was from Daniel, who asked for fluid intake recommendations, or I presume he's particularly uh, referencing water. Again, um, hard to make a very um, broad recommendation because anyone could be watching this video um, or no one. So it's just some things to consider um, and some general kind of, you know, tips, I suppose, um, for fluid recommend recommendations if you're dieting, um, depending really on where you are in your diet phase and what you're dieting for. But uh, water intake recommendations will vary person to person uh, based on the individual size and mainly activity levels, right? They're going to be the largest determining factors of how much fluid you need to intake to restore in your body. So for instance, if you're a 100 kilo person, you're going to need to drink more water than a 50 kilo person. If you cycle 50 kilometers every day compared to someone who sits at a desk all day, the 50 kilometer cyclist is going to need to drink more water every day. So there are calculators on the internet. You can go and find them. Um, I think a general rule of thumb, probably for most people, would be anywhere from you know, two to four liters. But again, if you're a big person who's highly active, maybe you need six. Uh, if you're a small person who's not very active, maybe one and a half is fine. Um, again, this is something that kind of you need to make on your own. But water can be useful, um, you know, particularly dur during dieting. Um, you know, they can be it can be used to kind of help um, you know keep you feeling full, um, which is kind of a weird thing considering water has no calories. But <clears throat> particularly when dieting for fat loss, you can find that. If you, you know, don't eat, if you're avoiding eating for an extended period of time, well, maybe you might unintentionally avoid drinking for an extended period of time. Um, and that can make you feel particularly depleted because now you're just maybe dehydrated and hungry. Um, 
So I like to, when I'm particularly dieting or when I have my clients uh, in a deficit, you know, maybe it's a good idea to have water with you and handy. Um, so you can kind of sip on it throughout the day. You can also utilize things like, you know, low calorie, um, like additives, like cordials and flavorings. Uh, if you find that you struggle with water intake, um, that can help, you, you know, drink sufficiently. Um, but yeah, you don't need to overdo it with water. I suppose, you know, we just want to avoid any instances where you are going really extended periods of time without water or on the converse, you're just drinking water, you know, not like a fish, but you know, unnecessarily, um, you know, so again, using your discretion, kind of work out what suits you, make sure you're not going to either ends of the extremes and you'll probably be okay. Um, and you know, when you're training, it might be a good idea to have water handy. Um, if you're finding that you're, you're particularly, uh, someone who sweats, then, you know, maybe you need to replenish more fluids throughout the day. Um, again, I can't know for sure, but you probably will. <clears throat> and then the last question we had, um, was from Hung who asked, this is a belter in my opinion, um, one that we often hear about, but besides hitting your protein target, are carbs and fats interchangeable as long as you don't go over your daily calorie intake? Really good question. Um, most people do interchange carbs and fats. Pretty much protein is like, you know, the king of the macros um, in the bodybuilding world or the, you know, training world. People just go, yep, protein is where it's at. As long as I get my proteins, I'm going to be golden. Um, you know, maybe that's partially true, but there are three macros and they're all, they all serve their purpose and function. So again, we want to be intelligent with the way that we are making decisions about our nutrition so we can get the most out of our meat wagons. So presuming that you have a protein target and a calorie limit, if you're dieting for fat loss, which hung is, um, I would typically recommend, um, not going below half a gram of fats per kilogram of body fat or body weight, right? So if you're a 70 kilo person, you don't want to go anything less than 35 grams of fat for an extended period of time. There will be some instances where it may be necessary. Say if someone is dieting for a physique competition, they're getting particularly lean, then it might be appropriate um, to go lower than that but again we kind of want to avoid going too too low on our fat consumption um, because fats are essential um, they serve many purposes including hormone regulation they help with brain function they help with our joints you know so we don't want to like you know cut all our fats out because hey carbs are carbs are great um, so again like i typically with my clients set a lower end target of fats and then a higher end, which is typically around, you know, one, 1.1 grams per kilogram of weight. Um, and then once you have your range for protein and fats, the remainder is to carbs. You know, maybe one day you go a little bit lower on your fats and you're closer to the lower end. And that means you get a little bit more carbs. Um, but again, we just want to kind of make sure that we're working within reasonable ranges. If you're just, you know, if you take anything to the extreme and it's probably not going to be um, as beneficial <clears throat> or it's going to come at some costs, right? So if you just, you know, consumed all your protein and then said, well, I can just consume my fats and carbs as I like, and I'm going to consume the rest of my calories from fats. Well, you're going to be missing out on a lot of, um, you know, the benefits of carbohydrates that have, you know, for performance, like, you know, you're not going to be eating any vegetables or foods that can potentially keep you a lot more satiated and full. Um, and conversely, if you go, well, I love carbs, I'm going to not eat any fats and I'm just going to skew all my, you know, remaining calories to carbs. Well, again, you're missing out on all of the benefits that fats have. Um, and you're probably, you know, not going to see too many benefits to the carbohydrate intake after a certain point. Um, so again, balancing your macros in a way that uh, kind of adheres to these general guidelines and then making that work for your individual needs um, and preferences is going to allow you to, again, reverting back to the initial um, or to the title of this video, or the main purpose is to help you balance um, flexibility and rigidity so you can sustain whatever it is you're dieting for, um, for the long run. <clears throat> uh, well, 
that is it. Um, hopefully some of you made it that far. Uh, hopefully I didn't bore anyone too much. Um, anyone who has any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments below. Um, otherwise I'll be an answering some more questions and doing another video shortly. Have a swell day.